Our next reading comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 9, beginning in verse 12 and going to verse 14. Here is our bread. It was still warm when we took it from our houses as our food for the journey. On the day we set out to come to you, but now see it is dry and moldy. These wineskins were new and we filled them and see they are burst and these garments and sandals of ours are worn out from the very long journey. So the leaders partook of their provisions and did not ask direction from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh God, Lord Jesus, you are master of both the light and the darkness. Send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do, help us to seek quiet spaces to hear your voice now. Our hearts are heavy to seek the joy of your presence. We are your people, walking in darkness yet seeking the light. To you, Lord, we say, come. Amen. The lead-up to this Advent journey in preparation for the Christmas celebration, the lead-up to this can be talked about from the scriptures in old to new as a journey. You can really frame the Advent season very much as a journey from this place to this place. We, we can think of even just the, the time around the nativity story as a journey, of course. Uh, early on, Mary travels to go see her cousin Elizabeth and Baby Jesus is in her womb, leaping for joy even then. Uh, We know, of course, the journey of Mary and Joseph to find the place where the child is to be born in Bethlehem. And it was a journey it took to get there. I'm sure a long and arduous journey to get there. Of course, we have the shepherds and the wise men who took their own winding journey to get to the nativity scene to worship the newborn child to be the savior of the world. They, They too took a winding journey. We can start all the way back in the beginnings of the Old Testament, the beginning of time when even Adam and Eve, they were planted in the Garden of Eden for a purpose, but uh, when they, as soon as they got kicked out of the Garden, they started a journey. You can make the argument, too, that when the people of God uh, really began uh, as a people uh, that are nomads, really on a journey, searching for God, searching for a place where they can be faithful to God and live out their life together. Uh, We can think of our own lives uh, this way. We can think of them as a journey, of course. Our lives go through a winding way, so for for some of you, your journey is more of a winding journey. Uh, For some of you, uh, maybe it's been uh, smooth and like a leisurely walk. Uh, I don't know many people like that, Um, but for some, maybe it's come easy, Um, but for other people's lives, it's maybe more like a roller coaster. Ups and downs, winding journeys uh, that have led you to this place, this moment right now. Uh, we know, of course, that journey all the way through again to the new, through the Old Testament uh, that leads up to our scripture with Joshua today. Uh, Moses has led the people uh, from bondage and slavery uh, over the Jordan and into the wilderness, and they begin to wind around, which is very, a very much a winding journey uh, through decades and decades, 40 years, in fact, before they make it to the promised land. We know, too, from Scripture that uh, Moses is not the one to lead them into the promised land. That, that settles on Joshua, and Joshua is the one that leads the Israelites into the promised land. The little snippet of Scripture that, was read, that I read this morning uh, begs a whole lot of background and understanding from how we arrived at this Scripture in the Israelites' life together. The point of it today, though, I want us to focus in on is that last verse, that when they arrived at a crucial point for the Israelites and for Joshua's leadership, they did not ask direction from the Lord. They did not ask direction from the Lord. Back in the day before uh, GPS, 
Uh, back in the day before GPS would let you know your fastest destination uh, to where you were going, uh, through that listening voice over your phone, I still have um, some qualms about that when you really think about that, uh, but through that listening voice, through the GPS, before all of that, there was something called MapQuest. You remember this? MapQuest feels like 50 years ago, but it was really more like 10 or 12. And on MapQuest, I remember uh, serving a church in Houston and uh, well before we had phones for this or before I was using it on my phone, I had an administrative assistant and when I needed to find a nursing home across town to visit someone, she would print me off a MapQuest directions. I don't know if you ever did that, but turn right here and turn left there. It was not necessarily the fastest uh, way to get there, but it was, it was the way uh, to, to, to get to our arrival. And that was the way we used to do it. Um, it's still around, MapQuest. You can still do that if you want to be sort of old school about directions. Um, uh, but that was a way that you found your way to point A or to point B. Those directions could fail you, though, sometimes. Um, uh, they could fail you because they really didn't know all the things that, uh, that are to be taken into account when you set out on a journey. And that's what GPS has made, uh, made better, uh, and that is to be able to give you some sense of what's the fastest way, avoid other kinds of traffic, even accidents and all the rest of it. And that's part of the beauty of, of GPS. Um, but even so, asking directions from a live person is really better, um, really better. Because sometimes GPS, you know, is not able to catch you up to where you are. Have you ever found that to be the case? Sometimes they can't exactly track where you are, and so sometimes they, they really have to catch up to where you're actually positioned in traffic. And so sometimes it matters uh, to be able to ask a live person directions, asking directions is always good. Now, some of us are better at that than others of us, right? And you don't need to like look to the person to your right or to your left. No accusations here this morning. Some of us are easier about asking directions than others of us. Sometimes we take a long time before we ask directions. Um, again, Joshua and the people here in this particular crucial moment did not ask directions from the one whom they needed to ask directions from, the Lord. Asking directions is always good. So the background of Joshua here, just very briefly, Joshua again has entered them into the promised land, uh, but they don't enter into the promised land with nobody there. It's not a blank slate, uh, an uninhabited land. It's an inhabited land, inhabited land inside and outside of the promised land. There are many nations, groups, and peoples that are gathered all around there, and one of those nation groups is the Gibeonites. You can read about the Gibeonites and, and go, go home and read all about them, but uh, they were a people that were worshiping other gods, but that heard about what the Lord had done in Egypt to lead the Israelites out of slavery. They were sort of, uh, they were hiding out in the promised land knowing that, that their defeat was likely from Joshua and the force, their, his forces from the Israelites because the Lord Yahweh that had delivered them out of slavery and bondage and into the wilderness and the promised land was the, was the Lord who was at work in them. And so the wind of the Lord, if you will, was at the back of Joshua and the Israelites. And so the Gibeonites knew they were no match for the Israelites, except that they were pretty sneaky about the way uh, that they, they, they entered in. So they go, in the pretext of our scripture today, they go to Joshua and decide to try to make a covenant treaty with, uh, with Joshua and with the Israelites and they're sort of sneaky about it because uh, without going all into the laws of Deuteronomy, they, uh, they were sort of sneaky about it because really um, they, uh, they had not come from a far off land like they had pretended. They had pretended that they'd been traveling so long that the bread was moldy when they got there, that they'd been traveling so long uh, that the wineskins had broken when they got there, but actually they were from, from there. They knew they were going to be conquered, and so they tried to get into the good graces of Joshua, and they set a treaty and a covenant. 
It was only after that treaty and covenant happened that Joshua understood their true identity. They sort of tricked Joshua into a treaty and a covenant. Again, you can go read about that. Uh, But Joshua sort of went in haste and hurried to make this treaty and covenant and then realized what had happened later on. But the scripture we zero in on this morning is, is that Joshua in his haste, in his hurry, did not ask direction from God before making a covenant with a, this group of people. He simply marched on, did not ask direction. How many times, how many times do we go about our life's journey never asking the directions from the one who can give them? It's a sermon really all to itself about the dilemmas that we face when we are confronted with all sorts of decisions when we haven't sought God. We need to ask directions from God. We, we have a hard time burying our egos in order to seek God's direction. Some of us have to bury self-interest to ask direction. Some of us have to admit that we don't know all the answers. Some of us have to be okay to sit in mystery for a while and wait and see what God sorts out for us. But all of us need to ask direction from God about big things and small things. So I wonder what you're facing, what sort of decisions and choices you are facing today or this week or in the coming weeks. What sort of decisions that you need to seek God about, ask for God's direction. So what journey are you on? How would you ask help from God or ask help from the people that God would use to come into your life and to give you direction and wisdom and clarity? We continue to ask this question as a church. How might God direct us and lead us that that we would always seek God and ask God for a direction of of every step of the way where God would lead us as a people? We need people that God puts in our lives to be spiritual guides, friends, a small group that can function as a place of guidance and wisdom to help us in our life's journey. I'm going to share a little, a little couple of uh, pieces from people I admire. Um, one from Henry now, and he says this, Your life, my life, is given graciously, graciously by God. And he says this, Our lives are not problems to be solved, but journeys to be taken with Jesus as our friend and finest guide. So often we think of our lives our decisions, our choices as some sort of problem or challenge to be solved as though we can do that all on our own. But if we were to understand life as a journey, as a journey in which we need to ask for direction every turn, every step, every destination we're trying to go, and to understand that Jesus is with us along that journey, we call on the power of the Holy Spirit to give us guidance along the way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, to deny oneself is to be aware only of Christ and no more of self, to see only him who goes before and no more the road which is too hard for us, that's too overwhelming for us, just to know that Christ is with us and Christ goes ahead of us is enough. He leads the way, Bonhoeffer said, he leads the way, keep close to him, ask directions. And then he finished, seek God not happiness. With God alone, you will gain happiness, but seek God first. We ask directions and then follow wherever God leads us. I have a top five favorite prayer um, that I have shared in sermons before, not here, but in sermons before comes from Thomas Merton, and he talks about the road and the journey and the unknowing nature of that, but his trust in God. And I, I want to share it again uh, here this morning. Um, it comes from Thomas Merton, and this, this, is how, this is his prayer. He prays, My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, 
nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think that I am doing your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I, and, and I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. See, that's the promise. That's the promise of God. Not that we get a blueprint of all of our life. Not that we get every single detail told to us ahead of time. That's not what we trust in. We trust in the one who's giving us direction, who's giving us wisdom, who's giving us leadership in our lives. And we call upon that one and trust that the Lord is with us. I, uh, I do love GPS. Um, I don't want you to go away with any impression that I don't love GPS. In fact, I rely on GPS all the time. It is really one of the great modern inventions of our time. And I, I think it's actually a helpful uh, analogy for us today. Because you know what happens when you plug in your destination in GPS <clears throat> and you want to go to the grocery store, and you plug that address in, and, and it starts to tell you, you know, take right and take left and go straight here and <clears throat> that way around the bend and whatever. But you know what happens when you take the wrong turn? <laughs> what does it tell you? <laughs> Rerouting, right? <laughs> or something like that. It doesn't say, um, too bad, you missed it, uh, you're not going, or whatever. Um, it says, listen, um, you made a mistake. I wanted you to turn here, but you actually went the other way. It doesn't give up on us. It just says, hey, but since you are over, since you took a wrong turn, you're now over here. Since you are over here, now I will lead you from there still to the destination. Maybe you know where I'm headed. <laughs> so it is with God, right? Just because we take a wrong turn doesn't mean God gives up on us. We ask direction from God, and we trust God, and we go the way God intends. But I want to say a word of grace today that even when we take a wrong turn, God has not given up on us. God didn't give up on Joshua. Joshua got it right sometimes after this. Joshua was a great leader for his people, and many great leaders came after him, especially our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from whom we seek wisdom today. So we're in good company when we, when we don't go the right way because we trust that God doesn't give up on us and that wherever we end up, God will reroute us to the destination that he wants for us, a church job, a relationship, health, and finally heaven for the kingdom to come. That's the ultimate destination, and that's the one that Jesus came to lead us toward. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your grace, your grace for Joshua and for the Israelites, and your grace down through the ages and equally to us. God, help us to ask you for direction in our lives, for ourselves, for our families, for our household, for our church. Help us to follow your lead and stay close to you wherever you lead us and to trust that you will lead us down the right road. This all we pray in Christ's name. Amen.